Hello friends and, and thank you again for joining us in this class as we study the 12 apostles, the 12 original apostles, 12 were chosen. We have completed studying about the 12 and, and what we're going to do in this particular lesson is take a look at Matthias and Paul. Although not of the 12 original apostles, we, we do see the tie-in, we do see them appointed uh, in, in the time frame with the other apostles and, and they, they played an important role, not only in establishing the, the church during its early years, but then helping it to grow. So we're going to be taking a look at Matthias and Paul. The lesson is entitled Transition to the Future. It is lesson nine in our series. The book of Acts is a fascinating book, and the book of Acts is often misapplied or misunderstood. The value of the book of Acts, of course, is that we learn how uh, God wants us to enter into the kingdom, to become citizens of God's kingdom. And that's, of course, through uh, the, the uh, process we go through, the elements of our uh, plan of salvation. Uh, the, the uh, believing in who Jesus is and, and understanding our need for his salvation, our repentance as we turn from focusing on self to, to uh, focusing on Jesus Christ and his teachings. And then, of course, we're baptized by immersion in water, as we see so many times throughout the book of Acts. And then, of course, uh, we begin to live faithful lives, uh, studying the teachings of Jesus uh, studying the teachings of the apostles and, and other early writers in the New Testament as they showed us how to put the teachings of Jesus into action. So all of that's the purpose of Acts. But there's something else about Acts that, that we see the book of Acts, and that is it's a book of transitions. Transitions us from the Gospels of Jesus where we have uh, the, the biography of Jesus and the teachings of Jesus and uh, we see the mission of our Lord and, and how he overcame uh, death and sin through the crucifixion and through the resurrection and then later, of course, ascending into heaven. But it's also a book of transitions within itself uh, in, in how it... Uh, shows how the apostles developed and how those early Christians developed and how they went from uh, being uh, specifically and physically followers of Jesus to now being who Jesus wanted them to be, the messengers, the ones that were sent out, fulfilling their role as apostles. And of course, we see some of the actions of some of the other uh, early Christians as well. So it's a book of transitions from the birth, life, and ministry, teachings of Jesus, to the spreading of the church. And, and then, of course, we have the rest of the writings of the New Testament, uh, what we refer to as the epistles. Uh, these, of course, uh, truly do show us how to live as citizens in God's kingdom. So Acts is well-placed and well-served as a book of transition. So within that book of transitions, we see the selection of Matthias as he replaces Judas. And we see how Jesus appoints Paul to be added to the number of apostles with the specific mission of spreading the gospel ultimately into all the world. Well, in this lesson, I want to take a look at how Matthias and Paul are called and, and some of the lessons we learn. Uh, from the actions of Matthias and Paul. Now you might think, well, what can we learn from Matthias? Certainly Paul, there's a lot to learn uh, because of all that he did. Well, Matthias, what, what, what is it we can learn from him? We, we see him mentioned and that's about it. But we still can learn from Matthias. In fact, we can even learn from Justice, the one not appointed as an apostle. So we'll, we'll talk about that as we go through this. And again, my intent is to show that God indeed continues to work. Uh, his, his word continues to live and to grow and, and help us become who he wants us to be. It shows us that God has a plan and is active in how that plan goes. Well, let's begin by taking a look at Matthias. Uh, Matthias, of course, was chosen to replace Judas. And we, we read about that uh, there in Acts chapter 1. Uh, we meet Matthias after Jesus has ascended back into heaven. 
there were about 120 disciples that, uh, uh, including the remaining 11 apostles, they were gathered in Jerusalem for some fellowship and prayer. They're awaiting Jesus' promise of the Holy Spirit. Now, they didn't fully understand all that was going on. There was a sense of uh, understanding there, I think. And there was also a sense of looking ahead, realizing something's going to happen. And so they're preparing themselves, they're preparing each other uh, in order to meet whatever it is happens. Well, Peter, uh, knowing the scriptures were to be fulfilled, he proposes that another man be chosen to take Judas Iscariot's place. He's going to be among the 12 now to maintain their number and their ministry. Remember, we talked about early on in the introductory lesson that 12 was significant. Not only did it symbolize the uh, 12 tribes of Israel, the, the old uh, law, but it was, it was establishing God's new kingdom, uh, the, the kingdom of our Lord. And, and so these 12 men would play a role. Uh, Peter based his suggestions on Psalms 109 and 8. He says, may another take his place of leadership. Uh, Psalm 69, 25, may their place be deserted. Let there be no one to dwell in their tents. So Peter understands the need for 12, someone to replace Judas. And he puts forth a list of qualifications for the selection. They need to be followers of Jesus from John's baptism until the ascension. So we see there that uh, there's some specific criteria that needs to be met. Well, two men met the criteria. One was Matthias and the other was Joseph or also called Justice or Barsabbas. Uh, I like to refer to him as Justice. But he, he was, uh, these two men were selected as candidates. And, and then an interesting thing happens. Uh, scripture doesn't give us information about them. But certainly, uh, based on Peter's stated qualifications that these men would have to meet in order to become apostles, um, it's obvious they had been faithful disciples of Jesus. And then that interesting thing occurs after, after uh, praying together, disciples cast lots. Uh, they, uh, how, whatever that was, they cast lots, uh, a, a kind of a random chance sort of a thing, uh, to discern who the chosen man would be. Well, the lot fell on Matthias. He was the one that came up as uh, the one chosen. Uh, there really is no mention of him or, or Joseph or Justice in Scripture up to this point. And uh, uh, so, so you would think, well, okay, that's it. That, that, that's the end of it. Uh, but there's some other things. Uh, nothing else is stated in Scripture about him. Um, it, it, he's just picked among the 12. But he's a very special individual. By the way, uh, a point of note, um, this is the last time that we see in the New Testament the using of lots in order to, to determine God's will about something. Uh, I, most of the uh, writers of, about uh, New Testament, the commentaries and all say, well, this was because now after this, the Holy Spirit would have a direct role through the lives of the apostles. He would be guiding them specifically in decisions. And so uh, there wasn't that need anymore for that process. So again, as I said, there was nothing else uh, following this directly mentioning Matthias and Justice. And, and, and so one begins to wonder, well, what is it we can learn? Well, before I, I want to go into some information about Matthias, I, I, I'd like to kind of talk a little bit about justice, uh, this, this uh, one not chosen. Because, I, you know, honor where honor is due. Although not chosen, he met the qualifications that Peter put forward. He had a servant heart. Uh, there, there's no record in Scripture of either of these two men, but certainly there's no hostility or bad feeling because he was not selected. Um, he didn't, he didn't uh, go off in a huff and have his feelings hurt. Uh, indications are he continued to serve in whatever capacity God needed him to serve in. Uh, and, and, and so we all serve in different capacities. Uh, in all of our roles are important. And, and so, okay, Justice was not selected to be an apostle, but that doesn't stop him from serving the Lord in so many other ways. And that, that's kind of the lesson for us that we can take away from this. 
Not all of us will be selected to be in some kind of a key position. We may even desire to be in a position of some kind, but for whatever reason are not selected or not qualified to be selected. And that doesn't keep us from serving the Lord. God has graced us with gifts, so many different ways in which to serve Him, and we can do that. Uh, whether you're a woman who cannot serve in a leadership position as an elder or a deacon or a, a preacher from the pulpit, there's still so many wonderful and so critical opportunities in, in which you can serve. And, and not always serving in a support role, which is a great role as a servant, but, but also serving in other leadership roles. You can still teach others about Jesus. You must teach others about Jesus. And yet even those of us who might be qualified as men to serve in specified leadership positions, we're not selected. Okay, we still continue to serve. We still continue to lead. We use, all of us use, no matter what, the gifts we have. So I take that from justice. Uh, and, and I appreciate that uh, in Scripture here that justice is mentioned. He's not selected, but it's not a bad thing. Justice continued to serve. Of course he did, and so do we, even though we are in so many different ways. So it's, it's just important, I think. It, it's, it's, it's an interesting little jewel that's out there in this great book, part of the process uh, we, we just can learn so many things from so many people. It, it's, it's, it's a wonderful thing. But let's go back to Matthias and, and talk about uh, what we learned from, from this apostle who uh, mentioned in name only. Although, uh, although there's not a lot there, we still see the idea of being faithful. Being faithful. We see clearly that Math, uh, Matthias and justice, both of them, their two names were put forward for decision. They were, first of all, faithful. That was a critical part of it. They had to have been there from the very beginning uh, of, of Jesus' ministry and followed him all the way through. So they were witnesses to it. And as witnesses, they had not only the direct knowledge, uh, but they also had the insights. They knew what had happened. Not, not just, yes, this happened, but the context of it, the, the surrounding things that happened. Uh, significant enough that they would then be able to tell others, let me tell you about Jesus. He said this. I witnessed him saying that. So it was important that they be a part of the entire process. So they were faithful. Remember, others had left Jesus because the teachings were just too hard. These men stayed with them, just like the other apostles did. They stayed with them. They wanted to learn more. They knew Jesus was indeed Lord and Savior. And because of that, uh, well, I mean, that's our first lesson. Uh, we, we first dedicate our lives to the Lord, and we commit to faithful living. That's the example they give us. Faith always comes first, but faith always has to have action, as we know. And that's the second part. We have to be ready to serve. We're not going to be appointed into a position or given the opportunity to be in a, a position of some kind and then learn how to serve. We first learn how to serve and be a servant and be in that role. And then it just naturally then uh, comes our way. So we must always be ready to serve. But it's not about us. The idea of serving is about pointing to the master. It's not being ready to serve and developing service so I can be in a position and I can be elevated. That is not at all the attitude. If that's the attitude, we don't need to serve and will likely not be in a position to serve. So we must be ready to serve. Uh, it's, it, it's closely tied to being faithful. Certainly none of the disciples thought uh, they would need to replace Judas, likely Matthias least of all. And, and uh, although the biblical record on Judas states he was the one who betrayed Jesus, it wasn't until he actually did it that they, they thought, okay, it is him. Uh, e even at the Last Supper, as Jesus stated, the one who would betray him, uh, you know, they asked Jesus to identify him. Is it I, Lord? Is it I? Uh, and, and Jesus identified just, uh, Judas by handing him a morsel of the bread and instructing Judas to do what he had to do. They, they still didn't understand that it was Judas as the betrayer. So none of us know for certain the future, the opportunities that are ahead of us. I can almost guarantee you this. 
you think you have a plan, you think you know clearly where you're going to be and what you're going to be doing, don't be surprised if that plan shifts a little bit. Life happens. The Lord has a different direction for us to go. So no, no matter the circumstance we find ourselves in, we're ready to serve. We certainly have knowledge of our gifts or our talents, and we can f develop those and be ready to serve with those. But the direction our life takes us sometimes, a lot of times, is so very different than what we think is going to be. So none of us know for certain the future ahead of us, but we submit our will to God, and we're ready to serve as He wants us to. The key there, of course, is readiness. Our role is to identify our capabilities, dedicate ourselves to making them available for God's service. One other note about this, um, we do think we know how the Lord wants us to serve, but opportunity is going to present itself in the way we least expect it, so always be ready. One other point here I want to note, we serve on God's time, not ours. I, I find myself doing things today that I wish I could have been able to do 10, 15 years ago, but I wasn't prepared 10 or 15 years ago. There was a, a period of seasoning that I had to go through. There's a period of growing in knowledge that I had to go through, a, a period of growing spiritually I had to go through, all of those kinds of things. And, and, and it's just true with all of us. We, we might be in a position we are right now and we say, oh, well, I wish I could have been doing this all along. But we need to be faithful. We need to be ready to serve because God will present us with the opportunities on His time not ours. Uh, we can try as mighty as we might want to to move ahead a timetable on something, but we fit our timetable to the Lord, not the other way around. It's not my will, it's thy will. We always remember that. Uh, God takes the eternal view. He knows the future for us. Uh, what, and, and what we do is we, we be ready. Uh, so the opportunity to serve will always be there and we need to be ready and faithful. That's what I take away from Matthias, the, the key lessons. Being faithful, be ready to serve, and uh, keep open and understand it. we serve on God's time. So don't get frustrated. Don't get tired. Don't just throw up your hands and walk away uh, thinking there's no opportunity. The opportunities are there, and, and they're all around us. And I've already talked a little bit about how some of the apostles very clearly show us that they were seekers learning God's will. There are seekers out there. There are people out there every day that surround us that are seeking to come to know the Lord. They may not even know they're seekers. And so we need to be ready to take the seeker to the Lord. God will always bring the seeker and the teacher or the guide together. And, and that's us. That's our unique role as disciples of the Lord. God gives us the responsibility to share the gospel. So we need to be ready. All right, well, I, I think that's enough for right now about Matthias and a little bit about Justice, the, these uh, two men that were looked at to replace Judas. Matthias, of course, was the one chosen. I want to shift now and talk a little bit about the Apostle Paul. Uh, I, I, I tell you, the Apostle Paul, of course, there's so much about the Apostle Paul. Um, we, we'll look at uh, his conversion. We'll, we'll look at some key things about him. And certainly we're going to look at uh, what we can learn from Paul. Well, Paul is introduced to us in Acts chapter 7, uh, there in 58, during the stoning of, of Stephen, the death of Stephen. Uh, as we read through that, we know that Paul was giving approval of Stephen's death. He was the one standing there keeping an eye on the garments of the ones who were actually doing uh, the physical killing. But because of that, Paul was an accomplice, and Paul would admit to that later on. Uh, he, he was the one that took an active role in persecuting Christians. Uh, and so that's when he's introduced to us just very briefly as, of course, Saul. I'll refer to him as Paul, but he originally was known to us as Saul. Uh, in Acts chapter 9, when the church is persecuted and driven out of Jerusalem, uh, he is appointed by the high priest to travel to Damascus to bring the Christians there to Jerusalem to face further persecution. Now, uh, Paul sought that commission. He wanted to do that. He was eager to go out. He thought in his mind he was doing God's will. 
the Christians were looked upon as this, this uh, rebellious group that were practicing blasphemy, following the blasphemer, the one who they had killed and, and the Jews had killed. And so now uh, these Christians needed to be rounded up and set straight. Some of them, however, might even have faced death uh, because of their actions from, from the Jewish perspective. Well, of course, we know the story. We, we know what happened. As he's traveling on the way to Damascus to, to uh, bring these Christians in for further persecution, uh, he's struck down by a bright light. Uh, he, he's, he's laying there on the ground. He's blinded. Uh, he hears a voice calling him that identifies itself as Jesus. Uh, Paul uh, uh, then is instructed by Jesus to go into Damascus. He's still blind, so he has to be guided into Damascus where he'll be told what to do. Meanwhile, Jesus uh, tells Ananias, a, a faithful Christian in Damascus, to go to Paul to tell him what to do. And he, Ananias is a little reluctant about that point. Uh, he knows Paul and he knows the reputation and what Paul was going to be doing. And, and I can almost, kind of like Moses, you know, Ananias is saying, are, are, are you sure? You, you know who you're talking about here, don't you? And, and of course, our Lord tells him to do so. I really like what is stated by Jesus in Acts chapter 9, verse 11. Jesus states that Paul is praying. And, and uh, the, I, I actually find that just a little bit humorous in a way. It's kind of a grand understatement, if anything. I see Paul uh, blind. He's got the dirt of the road still on him. And, and, and he's not sitting there uh, reciting some sort of canned prayer out of the book of Psalms or some other uh, book or writing. He's, he's not doing that typical liturgical kind of prayer. He's not praying the Lord's Prayer like so many people do. Oh, no. Paul, I see Paul in my mind's eye, flat out on the floor, arms outstretched, pleading with God not to strike him again. What is it you want me to do? Please forgive me for what I've done. Paul is having a very serious heart-to-heart -heart moment with the Lord. So when Jesus simply says, Paul's praying, that, that's a tremendous understatement. You, you can see it there. I, I, Paul was praying like never before. Well, the immediate answer to the prayer, Ananias comes to him. The immediate answer to the prayer is you need to become a disciple of Jesus first. Paul was ready. His conversion was not complete, but it started on Damascus on the way there. And, and of course, Ananias comes to him. He heals Paul and he taught him what he needed to do for salvation. Salvation must happen. And then our life and our actions have purpose, true purpose. Of course, that purpose is serving God, bringing glory to God, teaching others. Paul responds immediately. There was no hesitancy in Paul. Um, he was converted. He, he gets up, he's baptized. Uh, he then uh, becomes a disciple of Jesus Christ. Following this, Paul would spend the rest of his life, even to his death, teaching Jesus, building the church, expanding the kingdom, encouraging Christians all the way. No matter what Paul was involved in, he was always focused on how can I turn this situation into serving the master? Well, again, it's an understatement to say we can learn some things from Paul. Paul would go to write 13 of the 26 books of the New Testament. Uh, who knows how many other writings Paul did. Paul was a prolific writer. Now, sometimes Paul wrote it himself, but quite often Paul would dictate his words and someone else would write them, but they're still attributed to Paul. So there are so many other writings that likely that Paul did, uh, letters to the Christians, to the early church. But for now, I want to look at some specific lessons that we learn from Paul. What is it that Paul teaches us? Uh, that, that's what I want to focus on. Uh, can't cover all of them. I mean, that, that would be an entire lifetime study from the New Testament as we are engaged in. But I think there are some things we can learn from Paul to kind of help encourage us, point out to us the, the important uh, person that Paul was. Paul was not perfect in his life. Uh, e even as Paul served in his role as this, this giant of the faith, 
Paul still learned a lot. Paul was faithful though, no matter what, Paul was faithful. Uh, you know, in one time of introspection, Paul shares with us some thoughts about his failings. In Romans chapter 7, he states that he does what he knows not to do and does not do what he knows to do. Doesn't that sound like us? How many times have you done something and you say, why did I do that? What was I thinking? Father, please forgive me. I know better than that. And then there's other times, and oh, this hurts me personally. There's so many times that I've had the opportunity to say something about our Lord to someone and let that moment slip by. We've all done that. We've all had situations where we could have fulfilled our role as a disciple. We knew we needed to do something, and yet for some reason, we didn't. And, and, and we repent of that continually. Well, Paul expressed that too, this, this giant of the faith. And, and so if Paul's that way and we're that way, what are we going to do? You know, Paul even referred to himself as a wretched man in that passage. And if you looked up the definition of wretched, that's not a good word. You don't want to call somebody a wretched person. That's not a compliment. So Paul refers to himself of that. But in that moment where Paul's got this introspection, he always points to Jesus. He does in that moment too. He points to Jesus, to the power of Jesus to save us from our sins. Paul also stated in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned. Well, you know what? That all included himself. All have sinned. Paul recognized his role and his, his position <clears throat> as this disciple. He would talk about that. He would defend himself as an apostle. But he also teaches us to strive for God's standard of perfection. Uh, it's it seen, of course, through the saving blood of Jesus Christ. He tells us how to come into contact with that blood uh, through the baptism of Jesus. But, but Paul recognized he too is a sinner. He would talk about how he buffets his body daily so that after teaching others and preaching to others, he does not lose salvation. I, I think Paul was very aware of the danger of pride. And, and we just have to be very, very careful about that. And that leads me to my next point. Paul teaches us about humility. Here's Paul a rising figure among the Pharisees, a, a man with credentials, a man who has nothing but the future ahead of him, and he is knocked to the dirt. You know the old expression about knocked off his high horse? Have you ever heard that expression? Somebody's knocked off their high horse? I think Paul understood that because he was knocked off his horse into the dirt. I wonder if that's where that saying started from. But humility is a characteristic of Jesus, and one we possess, but for Paul, it didn't come easy. For us, sometimes it doesn't come easy as well, but he learned it. And you know, a lot of times what brings about humility in someone's life is a significant moment in their life. And it changes who they are. It changes their whole focus. This was a significant event for Paul as he traveled to Damascus. He was full of himself and his righteousness of his call. But being knocked down, he discovered he indeed needed Jesus. He needed and saw Jesus as master. Well, you know what? We don't have to let a significant moment happen to us. We can learn, <clears throat> excuse me, we can learn through the actions of what happened with Paul. And, and we can not be knocked off of our high horse. We don't even get on the high horse. We stay grounded. Uh, he, he was literally knocked down. And we don't have to be. We learn from him. Paul would speak to always keeping himself in check, relying on God's power, not his. Relying on God's power. And he lived to glorify God. Paul would say if he boasts, it's boasting about Jesus. He'd say, imitate me as I imitate Christ. So even though at times he might be the focus on something, he turned it quickly to Jesus. It's not about me. I'm just the instrument. It's Jesus. And that's the attitude that we have. And that's the humility that we can show. I'm the servant. And I, I really do mean that. I'm the servant. Jesus is the master. We grow in that. Sometimes we do get a little bit sidetracked and puffed up, but it's about Jesus. And, and, and I, I pray our Lord forgives me, forgives us if we lose sight of that. Bring us back. Uh, bring us back gently. 
Uh, I love the song, Lead Me Gently Home. Uh, that, that would apply here. Another thing, though, and I, I think this is Paul's legacy. Paul teaches us about salvation. He teaches us about what it is. And at the same time, though, he's teaching us how to apply that in our lives. How do you live as a citizen in God's kingdom? Uh, you're a citizen of a nation of some kind, and you're proud of that citizenship, but there is nothing greater by far than our eternal citizenship in God's kingdom. And Paul uh, goes beyond just teaching us how to get there. He teaches us how to live as citizens. Uh, much of Paul's writings speak to preparing ourselves for service to God, uh, that, that lifetime view uh, that, that really matters about being prepared for judgment. Uh, Paul took the principles of godly living and he teaches us what they look like in reality. Paul teaches us to apply knowledge. Paul not only taught us, told us, but then he showed us, uh, gave us a living example. Well, again, there is just so much we can learn from Paul. But let me wrap up by saying uh, we spend our lifetime learning how to apply the teachings of Jesus from Paul and the other apostles as we learn from their uh, uh, actions th throughout the Gospels. But, but Paul uh, teaches us uh, in the New Testament so much, the writings of Paul, those 13 different books. Uh, but uh, these two later appointed apostles, Matthias and Paul, they give us the overall lesson of preparedness in service of our Lord. Matthias was prepared to serve. Paul became prepared to serve and then quickly followed through with that. So we should be ready at all times to serve as our Lord needs us to serve. The opportunities are all around us. We need to seize the moment. Paul further teaches us that the service of our Lord is not on our terms. Paul had a vision of where he was going serving the Lord and found out that was not the Lord's vision. Uh, Paul learned to submit to the teachings of our Lord and, and to show us how to do so as well. Well, friends, this concludes our lessons on the apostles, the, uh, not only the the 12, including Judas Iscariot, but then also on Matthias and Paul that were later appointed apostles. I pray that we'll take the examples and lessons from these incredible men uh, and, and, and learn from them. Don't repeat the mistakes of Judas Iscariot. Look at the characteristics and the, and the actions of the 11 that remain faithful and then Matthias and Paul, put those into our life so we too can become who God wants us to become, and that's faithful servants of Jesus. I so thank you very much for your time, for the uh, desire that you have, and for the encouragement that you give me personally. But in all things, friends, always remember, we give God the glory. Thank you very much.